be an introduction. Then okay. I'll, I'll start. All right. You ready? How about it? Today is February 8, 2008. We are at the Mary L. Cook Public Library, Waynesville, Ohio. We're speaking today with Joseph Jorling from Lebanon, Ohio. And Mr. Jorling, if you would just give us a little bit of your background, your family background, biographical information so we can find out a little bit about you. Well, I was born in Cincinnati in Good Samaritan Hospital. And my mother always remembers that day because it was on Labor Day. She had some type of afterbirth problems that were kept her in the hospital for about three months. So she always remembers my birth. And I went to Summit grade school in Cincinnati. It was a, at that time just a boys' school, but it's now a combination of boys and girls. St. X High School, which was located in Cincinnati, on Sycamore Street, downtown. I used to walk about a mile, catch the city bus every day, take it downtown, take it home. We hear of that today. Kids can't walk more than one block. And I uh, graduated from St. X to Notre Dame for two years, uh, transferred to Xavier University in 1955. And the main reason for that was course, uh, course change from liberal arts to business. And uh, I thought I had a better chance of you know, getting a commission in the Army rather than the Air Force. So anyway, I transferred to Xavier University into the business school and with a minor in military science and graduated in 1957 with a commission as a second lieutenant with orders to officer's basic course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, starting in January of 1958. Can you of course, at that time, I just wanted, I was just going to do my two years. At that time, you had to spend two years or get drafted. And so I was going to just spend my two years in the Army and leave and go into civilian business. However, about three months before I was to exit the military, active duty, a former instructor at Xavier called me and said, I want to have lunch with you at the officer's club for you and your wife tonight. So I knew something was up. So my wife and I went over there and he said, I am been named as a new battalion commander of a unit which is going to go to Germany to support the German uh, Corps. And I'd like, and I am looking for some good lieutenants. And he said, I'd like to have you join us. And I said, Well, I can. I'm getting out in two months. Well, he said, if you really want to go, I'll take care of that. You just tell me what you want to do. So my wife and I got home, and about two hours after we got home, we discussed it and decided that yeah, that would be a, a nice opportunity. So to make a long story short, I called him the next day told him that we would be more than happy to join the unit with their later displacement to Germany. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, a courier comes by our apartment at Fort Sill. 
with orders to this battalion that he was forming. And he was forming it from scratch. He didn't have any, there were any soldiers in it, no men in it, no officers, nothing. I was one of the first officers to join the unit. And of course the courier had orders for me to go to the Union unit and also had put me on indefinite status as far as my military career was concerned, which mean, which meant that I could stay as long as I want. So joined the unit. Six months later, the unit rotated to Germany. And we were there during the Berlin crisis of 1958. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe it was 19, 19 I say 58. It probably was later. It was during Kennedy's administration when the Russians decided to blockade the routes to Berlin again. I was in a, a nuclear weapons battalion, Honest John. And we were called to our alert position. And we were training down at Grafenbeer, which was a old German training ground. And that's where we trained every year for about three, two to three months. And we were down there training when we got this alert, which we knew was pretty, pretty critical. Because when you get that code, it means that something's, something's going wrong. So we were called to pick up our nuclear weapons, which were in a bunker, and go to our alert positions and get ready to fire a nuclear weapons. People ask me, time later, did you have any protection against firing a nuclear weapon when, by mistake? And I said, no, there was no protection. All I had to do was press a button and it would have gone. And they thought that was unbelievable, but that's the way it was. So anyway, the unit which Kennedy sent through to break the blockade. He actually sent a unit of infantry battalion through the blockade into East Berlin. And of course the Russians and nobody touched them, so the situation was over because we had our path back to get supplies into the people. Do you remember how long that lasted, the blockade? Approximately? Mm, probably not very long. Uh, maybe a month. And this is the time of the Berlin airlift, correct? Uh, this was not the airlift. Okay. The airlift was in the Truman. Okay. This was after that, and it, that's why it didn't last as long, because they backed off when they saw that we weren't going to put up with this. They backed off, which is normally what happened. I mean, it happened again when we were uh, in Germany, of course, but the uh, Cuban situation came up at that particular time. And also, we were put on high alert during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it gets kind of, uh, kind of upsetting, should I say, when you're on a situation where you might have to shoot a nuclear weapon. And Did you know you, the target? Please? Did you know your target? Was that something that everyone oh, knew? Yeah, we knew our target. It, it, it amazed me that we had an agreement with the Russians, believe it or 
you're not, you probably never know this, and so they might. But we had an agreement with the Russians that we could send two people into East Germany to observe their unit's activity. By the same token, we gave them permission to come into our sector to observe our activity. So every time we went from the concern to train, we had a Russian liaison officer with us. And the reasoning behind that was? I don't know the reason behind it. I know that some of our officers were prisoners of war in Vietnam, and they didn't look kindly on that. So when we went to the field, I don't ever quite understand this, when we went to the field, they always picked out a bivouac area which had an entrance and an exit. So when we went to the field, we went into this entrance, and then we stopped right at the exit. And we had these signs in Russian that they were not allowed to pass critical points in the units. So we put a sign up at the entrance, we put a sign up at the exit, and we were there for probably four or five days. And the Russians were there, they couldn't go one way or the other. They had to sit there for four or five days. You know, it was all a big, big game. So. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, after this crisis period passed in Germany, then what was the next um, step in your career, in your military career? I forgot to put that on there, actually. I, I put in for schooling, to teach school, because uh, you need to get that on your record as an instructor, whether it be in ROTC or military academy or whatever, some, some phase of instruction. And so I put in for ROTC instructor and believe believe it or not, got orders to go to the University of Missouri as a, an ROTC instructor or assistant professor of military science. I was there for three and a half years. The thing about getting an assignment like that, the universities at that time had an agreement with the uh, military. If you got assigned to their school, the Army or Navy or anybody could not take you out of that position until three years were up. So we all knew that we were there for three years. And it was a good experience. Uh, I uh, had classes in gunnery and military history. It's tough to teach college students because they question everything. Are you sure about that? <laughs> but it was a good experience, and I also was uh, lucky enough to get the rifle team moderator, become a rifle team moderator. And in the Big Eight Conference, any, any place west of the Mississippi River, rifle marksmanship was big. And you, they actually gave you a varsity letter and had a banquet for you at the end of the year and so forth. I had a, a gal, and, and girls could participate in this. I had a gal that was, uh, girls can shoot a lot better than men because they seem more relaxed. But she went on to be an Olympic uh, champion. Hmm. Of course, I didn't benefit from that because I was long gone, but she became an Olympic champion, and uh, I was pretty proud of that. But uh, the 
Big Eight Conference by giving a lot of emphasis to rifle and marksmanship also gave you the facilities that the football team had, for instance, or the basketball team. So if I had a competition, say in El Paso, Texas, well, I'd call up and I'd say, I need the university airplane to go to El Paso, Texas this weekend for a meet. And it'd be waiting for us. And we'd fly down to El Paso, Texas and come back, which was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. So after you completed your three years there, then what? where did you go? I went to the Command and General Staff School at Fort Leavenworth, which you have to have in order to get promoted to major. And I was a captain at the time. And I completed that. Activities uh, when you were young come back to haunt you. And I just, I just remember carrying a rifle and a 50 pound backpack on my belly, crawling through barbed wire and so forth, and saying to myself, you know what? Really good for the body. And it isn't I, because I've had two hip replacements now. Of course, you, when you get to be age 60, it seems like the whole world falls apart. So I've had two hip replacements, three open heart surgeries. I have a doctor, a nuclear. Uh, from that is pretty bad. I ran into an old army physician over at Middletown Hospital and he said, you know what, I think I can fix that and we don't need to operate on you. I said, well go ahead, I'm open. So he went in and he burnt the nerve endings of the nerve, six nerves burnt the nerve ending, took away all my pain. And I went back to the neurosurgeon. He said, well, I think correct the problem. I'm saying, well, yeah, they corrected it for the next year and a half. And he said, after a year and a half, the nerves are going to grow back. He said, we'll do it again. I said, that, you know, he wasn't too happy with that. But that's what happens. I understand football players now when they get to us to 60 years old and they're hardly being able to walk because of arthritis in their knees and legs and so forth. I know how they feel. <laughs> well now, your time in Vietnam came after you went to this um, command school? Command and General Staff. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what year were you sent there or about approximately when were you sent there? Where did you go in Vietnam? Uh, I didn't actually go to Vietnam. Okay. I was on alert to go to Vietnam. During that period of time, everybody was on alert to go to Vietnam. It was like everybody being on alert to go to Iraq today. People say, is that how you felt when you were, uh, you know, standing by for, you could have gone in, in 24 hours? And I said, yeah. I said, we were ready to go. Never went, but I, you know, when the Iraq thing came up, they said.
said, my son says, if you could, Dad, would you give it a wreck? And I said, he had a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, I could have a wreck. And why is that? Because of the good that the, the good that the military is doing over there is not seen by the average person in the United States. And if we're going to be a peace-loving nation with freedom for everybody, like our Constitution said, and our Declaration of Independence, also the forefathers saw it in there that we should be the nation that spreads democracy in the world. And if we're going to do that, we should not let people suffer from tyrants. And that's why, basically why I would go. What is it that we're not seeing in general? We're not seeing the good things that the American military is doing over there. Uh, building schools, educating, giving them medical assistance. But I won't talk about that. They only talk about car bomb that killed four or five of them. And you have to understand these soldiers are all volunteers. They're volunteers because of the fact that they want to spread what we have here to other nations that don't have it. That, that's my feeling. Okay? But I'm, I'm sure that's the feeling of most Well, since you bring Iraq up, do you see a big difference in um, the military now and then, aside from the fact that it's all volunteer? Do I see a big difference? In Just in any, in any facet of the military, from the time when uh, you served? They're better educated. They're uh, more dedicated. We, uh, we were at a time there was a time, probably the right after the Vietnam situation, when we, or even during the Vietnam situation, when we were uh, drafting Cat Fours. Now, Cat Four I uh, mean anything to civilian people, but a Cat Four was a person who couldn't even read or write, or he was. Uh, convicted of a felony, and uh, the judge gave him the opportunity to go into military service or jail. Those were the kind of people that we were dealing with, and that wasn't an easy chore. So I, you don't have to deal with that today with an all-volunteer force. However, the situation is now, I looked at the Employment of our military, I get the Army Times and I try to keep up with the military aspects of, of history. But the Military Times came out and showed the displacement of our military in the world. Can you wouldn't believe it? We're in about 117 countries we have units. itself, the quality of the soldier today is much better than it was in Vietnam when we had a draft. Mm -hmm. um, going back to this time when you were on alert for Vietnam, where, where were you stationed at that point? I was in Fort Sill. Fort Sill. And then uh, I was were you... in Fort Sill, but I had, I was in a inch, well it doesn't mean anything to you, but an eight inch uh, power 
culture at the time. And we had, at that time, we had, I think it was seven C5As, which is the biggest troop transport there is, sitting at our airfield to take us any place, actually any place in the world, in 24 hours. So we were always ready. You know, we had all our shops and we had our duffel bags ready to go and all that ready on the line to go in 24 hours someplace. That could have been a 10 buck two, you know, but we were ready to, to go. So at that time you were a battalion commander? No, I was an S3 at that time. Okay. Which was much better than a tank commander because yeah. you, an operations officer, performs all the training or schedules all the training and operations of the unit. Okay. And it's a great job. And so you were at that facility for quite a while then doing that? Well, as an artilleryman, Fort Sill is the artillery school. Okay. So artillerymen always go back so, at, you know, during their career. Armor is at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Armored officers always go back to Fort Knox during their career. Uh, infantry is Fort Benning. Infantry school at Fort Benning. But they also are heavy or airborne. So you end up, when you finish an assignment, going all, always back to your home base, so to speak. Yeah, your branch, your branch uh, base. Okay. Then what happened after that time period in your service? I got out and went into uh, a reserve unit in Cincinnati. And at that time, I was a... Uh, major and was made the executive officer of the unit, which is really a job, a more of a disciplinary job, watching, keeping the discipline in the unit, the morale of the unit for the commander, inform the commander when things aren't going so well, maybe one of the companies or batteries and because I was there it, uh, it was a great way to get my uh, silver leaf which was a colonel leaf and uh, I finally got that became lieutenant commander of the reserve unit was there for three years which was the maximum allowable for an officer to spend in that assignment. So I knew I was going to have to go after three years. Our headquarters was in Columbus, and all the staff positions for colonel, full colonel, were in Columbus. And even the even though the ARCON commander wanted me to come to Columbus and fill one of these positions, so I'd get promoted to that. I figured, uh, I don't know, my wife figured really, she says, you know, you told me that when you got to a certain point, we would settle down and you wouldn't be doing all this traveling anymore, or we wouldn't be doing any traveling anymore, or separation and all that, because it is kind of difficult on the family. Family really has to sacrifice uh, if a fellow is going to make a military career. But I was the thing that I, I liked about the military career, and I didn't think about it when I entered it. I didn't have any uh, uh, idea of even going any further than the two years. The fact was that I got was able to get the respect of people under me. doing so, I enjoyed the leadership role from the lowest to the highest. And I never wanted
wanted to sit behind the desk or teach school. I wanted to be with the men because I felt I could lead them and become more or less good examples to themselves and to the country. And for some reason or another, I just had the knack to do that. And, and I enjoyed it, and I said, you know, people need that discipline, they need that guidance to become what they really want to be. And I didn't care if they stayed in the military or not, I just wanted them to be, to think that they can be a credit to themselves and to fellow man. So of your time in the service, was that one of the most significant points? What else um, did military service bring to you? Well, if I had, if I had, if I was in charge of the youth today, send them all to the military service for two years. Because of the discipline. the discipline? and the camaraderie, uh, the teamwork. It really takes a lot of teamwork. And try and take, well, as a tank commander, 165 men to have one objective and work together. That's pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. Did but you have a lot of disciplinary problems that you had to handle or not really? No, uh, I, I feel that as leaders, the best way to be a leader is to set the example. Don't expect your men to do something that you can't do. Don't ever expect that because you'll ruin their confidence. But if you can, have, they say, it's just like in the morning we have inspection every morning. And my my shoes were always at a high polish. And believe it or not, this, the jailhouse lawyers we call them would tell. He can do it, I can do it. And that's basically what you try to instill in them. And it works. It works. Don't expect a man to go on a 40 mile hike if you can't do it. So when we went on 40 mile hikes, even though my feet were blistered and bloody and all that stuff, I was in front of them not at the back of them, and every one of them made it. And, and it's just, just human nature. Now after you got out of the service, then what did you do in civilian life? I bought a printing business, a small printing business in Newport, Kentucky. Settle down. You get rid of the stress. You can have another one. So, sold the business. My wife and I decided that maybe we'd like to open a bed and breakfast. So we got into bed and breakfast. problem with running a bed and breakfast is that it's always on a weekend and you lose track of all your friends because you're entertaining the guests. But we had people from India, from Japan, it was unbelievable. It was, every time, every time you have people like that, you get in a conversation with 
And so then you're no longer doing that. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about, you, you talked about the um, stresses on the family line. Uh, you have children? Mm -hmm. Okay, how many children do you have? Four. Four. And so they were, uh, came along, did you have children before you were in the service? Or? No. Okay. So they pretty much grew up the entire time that you were in the service. Well, see, I graduated in 57, and I entered the service in January of 58. So, uh, and of course, I told my loved one that it was either get married and come with me or we break off the relationship. I didn't say it that way. diplomatic, but she had never been out of the city of Cincinnati, believe it or not. Her dad was a plumber, and the, they didn't take, their summer vacation was out to Brown County State Park or something like that. She'd never been out of this state, and all of a sudden I'm telling her we're getting up and moving. So Forksville, Oklahoma. Can you imagine how that went over? <laughs> but she was she was a good military wife. She really enjoyed it. And times when I wasn't there, it's amazing. Military wives stick together and they do things together. And, and if somebody needs something one more away, they all pitch in. Unbelievable. I mean, if you could do that in civilian life, it'd be great. Did any of your children enter the military? No, none of them did. However, you got grandchildren that are going in the military, which another generation. But I think I think they got tired of moving around. <laughs> It's not that they don't believe in the things that the military are doing or, or the things that we're doing as a country to, you know, to forge freedom in other countries. I, think, I just think that they were tired of moving around and wanted to stay home for a while. <laughs> but I can't complain about them. I got two lawyers bank vice president and a purchasing agent for a loan. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that we need to mention or that we've overlooked while we've been talking that you'd like to bring up about your time in the service or how it affected any part of your life? articles and taking photographs, so I finally became the editor of the school annual, and it's still, the National Scholastic Association for Publications awarded it as the number one high school annual. Remember when you asked us what we wanted to be? I said, yeah. There's three things you wanted to be. You wanted to be a, a fireman, a plumber because of your father-in-law, uh, or a carpenter. And now you went, and now how did that feel?
put into your your attorneys? Do you do you charge a fee for for <laughs> carpentry when you go out to somebody's house? It, it's funny. You always have one kid though that's going to be a renegade, and I did. The second child was a boy, and he was he was smart. I mean, he he, he wouldn't have to. He, I think he had a photographic memory. He'd sit down and read a book in the space of an evening and tell you word for word what the book was about. Didn't have to study. Study, you know, classes were too easy for him. So we ended up going, going to college, we went to Miami. Six months after he was in Miami, they threw him out. He came home. They gave him a, uh, a dispensation uh, saying that he could come back within a year if he decided to study. Well, he went back in a year. Six months later, he was back on my doorstep again. Dad, I've decided I don't need a college education. I'm going to go to Florida and I'm going to repave blacktop. I'm going to form my own business. And I got three other guys from school that are going to do the same thing with me. So they all get in a car and they go down to, to Florida. Three months later, the three of them, three of them had left. They had to come back to Cincinnati. My son's still down there because he signed a year's lease on an apartment. And now he doesn't know how he's going to pay for it. Well, father-in-law bailed him out. So he comes back to Cincinnati. And believe it or not, unbeknownst to me, he's taken night classes, if you see graduates, takes a law exam, gets a 98 percentile on the light law exam, could have gone to any law school in the country, goes to law school. My older son, of course, went to law school, was up all night studying and all this kind of stuff. Yet, he didn't study. Just through law school. It was easy. Mm -hmm. So I got two lawyers to help me out on all my problems. Do you still have contact with some of your, well you said you did, you had friends from the military service that you still keep in contact with? Uh, I stay in contact <coughs> with several because of the fact we have a reunion every five years. Mm -hmm. Actually, coming up this summer in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the unit that I was with in Germany is having a reunion there, and this is about the third one that I've gone to. And those people, I guess, what made it such a special unit is because we had a ob objective in mind. Uh, we had to do it together. situation uh, that you want to be in. Every man in that unit, from private to battalion commander, is college educated. Mm -hmm. And there's not many units that can do that, but 4th Army, when we were forming the unit at Fort Hill, said you could have the pick of anybody in the 4th Army area. So we interviewed people in fourth on the area. We brought them in from Chicago, from Denver, from I mean, post that you would, you know, wouldn't even hear of. And one of the requirements was that you had at least two years of college education. And it was a crackerjack unit after we got finished, I think. 
your family, were your parents, what type of occupation were they in? Please? Your parents, what occupation were they in? My dad was a chemical engineer. And you had siblings? Did you have siblings in the military? Please? Did you have siblings who also served in the military? Did I have children? No. Siblings. Do you have brothers and sisters who served in the military? No. My mother didn't like the military. She uh, thought that that was a place for criminals. about your just day-to-day -day, uh, communications and all that? It, of course, everything there was by mail, and then were there long delays in receiving your letters and so forth from home? Or did you get it on a regular basis? Uh, my dad, believe it or not, wrote me every day in Germany. He had such great penmanship. I guess that was part. He was in the printing business. He kept going to your in the printing business. When I went into the military, my mother was not. She was from the old school that decided that, yeah, you went to the military if you didn't have anything else to do. But he was very supportive and very interested in everything I did. And every promotion I got, and every command I got, he was always there. Was your, um, did you have any problems as far as um, just your daily rations and food and all that? That was not an issue for, your, for you in your service time as far as? Uh, yeah, that's an issue for me. So I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, a happy soldier is a soldier that had, has a full stomach, and not just a full stomach, a, a, you know, some, some units you get in and, and you, know, you follow the menu, the Army puts out a menu, you follow it straight, but if you get a good mess sergeant, it's like getting a good wife who knows how, who loves to cook, he will take that ration and really make it something special. And the men appreciate that. And if they eat good, they perform well. Are there any other things that, that went into your day-to-day -day, uh, workings that, that you felt were interesting to mention? That I thought what? That were interesting or something we may not know or may not understand. Actually, when you think about it, we went to West Point uh, for about, well, I guess it was four weeks ago. Four weeks ago, we have a, uh, on my second 
married from the get. She has a son that's a physician and got assigned to West Point. And so we went up there and visited him for four days. And I had, I don't think anybody has any idea what goes on at West Point. Those, those kids that are being trained at West Point are the future of America, whether it be politics or in the military. They're going to be there. And I don't think you uh, I don't think give enough credit to that situation. Just like we don't give enough credit to the people that are getting commissions in ROTC. It used to be that we had a big ceremony at the end of the year, at the end of the college year, where we would have a parade and all of the cadets from freshmen to seniors would march in that parade. And all the families would come out and look and watch. That's not done anymore. We really don't. We don't sell good things about the military that we used to. And, it get, and I think it has, uh, comes back, we have problems about that. Uh, I think if we educated civilian people more about what we do in the military, we'd be better off. We'd be better support. How would we go about that? What would be a good way? Well, for, uh, for special days like uh, Armed Forces Day and Fourth of July and things like that, I think we should, uh, we could, I say we should, have some types of military ceremony uh, that the civilians can participate. what's going on. We're just not there to protect them. We're there also to make better people out of uh, people that don't have the opportunity to make it any place else. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? We have about just a few minutes left. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, we thank you so much for your interview today.